Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview was an utter delight for me to do uh, with a, uh, ph- sadly it wasn't face to face with a philosopher by the name of Julian uh, Bagini and uh, we had uh, uh, a good laugh or two, we connected on a variety of levels uh, and we talked about his latest book, The Edge of Reason, subtitled A Rational Skeptic in an Irrational World. Um, we talk about knowledge and about ethics. We talk about uh, empiricism and, and, and evidence and when is enough enough and, and, and notions of how we have to you know, mis- mistrust ourselves and our trust in reason. And, and Julian talks a great deal about, uh, about this idea of, of, of thick and thin, I hope, at has your interest, and and and, and this notions of absolute skepticism versus what he calls mitigated skepticism, and how sometimes we can get just so lost in the minutia. Anyway, I hope you uh, join us, and I think you're going to really enjoy this. Uh, and the book is terrific, uh, "The Edge of Reason." Again, a rational skeptic in an irrational world. Uh, Julian uh, Bagini coming right up. And don't forget, davidpecklive.com for more information about my podcasting, close to 300 interviews. You can support uh, my podcasting through patreon.com. Uh, and uh, you can re- uh, read more about my uh, book, Real Change is Incremental, about my own public speaking. And don't forget, rabble.ca. Julian Bagini coming your way, the edge of reason. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by a very special guest today. It's taken us a little while to make this happen, but I am absolutely thrilled. Uh, We have Julian Bagini here with us today, and we are going to be talking about a whole lot of things, including his latest book, The Edge of Reason. Julian, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate you joining us. Well, thank you for having me, David. So, so sadly, my podcast is called Face to Face, and you and I are, uh, we're, we're a long way away from each other. And, is, and isn't it marvelous that that we can have this conversation about, what is it, a seven-hour flight away from each other? Yeah, absolutely. It is, it's We kind of take it for granted. We got used to it so quickly, haven't we? But, you know, this was Space Age. This was Star Trek when I was growing up. <laughs> it really was. So you are in the UK. Where are you, actually? Uh, Bristol, which is in the southwest of, of England. Very nice. Excellent. My father grew up in Luton, so I actually carry a British passport, so we do share a little bit more than just a digital connection right now. Great. Excellent. So The Edge of Reason, your new book, A Rational Skeptic in an Irrational World. Um, your website, microphilosophy.net, I think people are probably already starting to get a little bit of an idea more about you, but can, can I just read a quick quote? And I think it's the first paragraph from your book. Quote, we have lost our reason and our loss is no accident. Gradually, the contemporary West has become more and more dismissive of the power of reason. Caring for it less, we often find we have carelessly left it behind. When we do try to use it, we're not quite sure how to do so. We've become suspicious of its claims, unwilling to believe that it can lead us to anything worthy of the name truth, close quote. Are you a radical skeptic? <laughs> uh, no, not at all. No. Well, I mean, although, you know, these categories are, are very fluid, aren't they? Was I suppose the answer to that is, was David Hume a radical skeptic? Yeah. And um, some people claim he was. I don't think he was. Um, so David Hume... Scottish Enlightenment philosopher is really one of my heroes. And in a way, you know, this whole book is a kind of 21st century Hume. That's the way I see it. Now, Hume did say a lot of things which sounded, on the face of it, remarkably um, sceptical. You know, he, he claimed that we didn't observe uh, cause and effect directly in the world and that we had no kind of, you know, logically rigorous Uh, inference by which we could conclude there was cause and effect in in the world. Uh, He thought that uh, basically moral reasoning was a root about our emotions and reason had nothing to do with that. So a lot of his headline claims 
sound sort of radically sceptical. But, you know, you, you, you go beyond that, and it's quite obvious. He, he, at the end of his inquiry, he talks about how a kind of an absolute scepticism is impossible and undesirable mm. and crazy, and you couldn't live with it. What he advocates is what he calls a mitigated scepticism. So this is where, you know, you come through philosophy and thinking to recognise that our knowledge has huge limits, and there are lots of things we have no choice but to take for granted. But having done that, you then live within those limits and you know, basically you use your reason as best you can. So the kind of radical scepticism which says, oh, we just we don't know anything and everything is uncertain. So, you know, everything's just opinion or, or fiction. That That's far too strong. And no one can really live by that. You know, some people might proclaim it, but you know, they don't turn into radical sceptics when, for example, they try and decide what medicine to take to cure their disease <laughs> right. or, you know, which airline to take, uh, which is at least likely to crash or so forth. So in the in the paragraph, and you 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 put a, a truth, you you spell it with a small t, and you ital and you don't italicize it. You put it in quotes. Do do you so you? I mean, based on what you just said about airlines and, and sort of the fruits of applied science, I suppose you do believe in truth of a particular sort. Is that a fair quest, uh, question or yeah. a fair claim? Well, I do. I mean, it's interesting. You know, obviously, my my background is very much in you know, analytic philosophy. I've done a PhD and everything, and I have a lot of uh, respect for the academic side of things. But I do think that sometimes, uh, when it comes to applying these things to the practical world, you can get lost in the minutiae. And you know how you define truth in a way that's going to be perfectly satisfactory to the most rigorous analysis. You know, I'm not going to pretend that's not a complicated issue. Sure. But for all practical purposes, I think it's just crazy to deny there is a distinction between truth and falsity. Now, of course, you have to allow all the caveats there. Um, it's often not possible to establish with absolute certainty what the truth is. In fact, I'd say it's almost always uh, maybe even always impossible to establish with absolute certainty right. what the truth is. There are also some domains, such as the moral domain, where truth perhaps isn't quite the right word because what we're reaching for isn't something which is just true or false. It's things we have better or worse reasons to believe in and so forth. But, you know, in practice, of course there's a distinction between true and false, and it doesn't take very long to sort of like get anyone to sort of <laughs> buy into that. You know, I mean, you, people need to know if it's true or false, whether or not their contract binds them to something. You know, pe people who complain to, claim to have no interest in truth and say there's no such thing as absolute truth will soon become very interested in the truth if you're like taking them to court or something, right. or, if, or if you've slandered them or libeled them, you know. So, you know, truth with a small t is an indispensable part of life. And the fact that it's often difficult to establish beyond all contention is no reason to not value it and not to try and pursue it and defend it. So my daughter, uh, nine-year-old, uh, nine Victoria is her name, uh, no kidding, uh, Julian, 10 days ago, I'm sitting downstairs reading the paper. She comes down, plops right down beside me. Dad, do you believe in Santa Claus? And, yeah. <laughs> and knocked my socks off. I'm getting a little bit of a shiver as I ask you this question. I will never forget it. I keep a diary of, of these moments with my kids. And so, of course, this one's gone into it. But I wasn't ready for it, really, in a sense. And I guess maybe her friends or something she'd seen on the net or whatever. I mean, and, she, and she's a bright uh, kid, you know. She's asking really good questions. Our, our kids do, and most children do. Um, and you know what I did? I didn't say no. I said, you know what, sweetie, I believe in the truth of Santa Claus. I believe, <laughs> I believe in, the, in the truth, sorry, I believe in the truth behind Santa Claus. I believe in the story of it. I believe, you know, so much of what we believe, sweetie, isn't actually, you know, and we get into this conversation, and, and it wasn't that I was trying to deflect at all. I really saw it as this teachable moment to say there's something about Christmas that's kind of cool, that's kind of amazing that's about generosity and, and and about gift giving and about being with others and community and so i i leaned on that maybe somebody looking in would just laugh and go oh there was a parent who didn't know what to do who was <laughs> who was who was clearly scrambling but you know what as i've reflected on it and told the story a few times i think there is a truth to santa claus yeah i mean i think your answer is i mean Crikey, did she keep up with it? It sounded like a very sophisticated answer. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we underestimate kids, don't we? we? You no, know I, what? We totally underestimate kids. Yeah. That's one of the things I've learned as a parent. Not only are they incredibly resilient, 
um, but they're they're ridiculously smart. I mean, wasn't it Einstein who said the, a five year old knows more physics than most physicians, do, uh, you know, uh, physicists do? It may have been, but I mean, what interests me about your answer is that you know I think it was a, a shrewd one in lots of ways because I think a lot of people who are kind of in the broad scheme of things, let, let's say, you know, in my team, when it comes to worldviews, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm an atheist, I believe in, in reason, I believe in evidence and science and so forth. But I find a lot of people are in my team, as it were, a, a little bit too obsessed with, you know, true or false, yes or no, is it a matter of verifiable empirical right. fact? Right. And if not, you know, then get rid of it. It's, there's, there's not the truth. Now, actually, I think, you know, the way truth functions as a value and the way it functions in its utility, it's a lot more complicated than that. So, for example, something which is um, absolutely 100% factually true can be used in such a way as to promote a kind of a more general viewpoint, if you like, which is not truthful. So this is, for example, that happens when you cherry pick evidence, for example. Right. You know, it may be true that the person who attacked the person in the street down the road was a was an immigrant, for example. But you know, when that truth is used to kind of in the service of a kind of xenophobic sort of narrative, it's a truth being used for a sort of a, a broader view, which is not truthful. Similarly, there are obviously truths behind things which we have no. Yeah, we, we know are not factually true. That's why we like, uh, one, one of the reasons why we value things like literature. I mean, literature is by definition made up, but it speaks truths to us about uh, the human condition and, and, and so forth and psychological motivation and so forth. So, you know, if you're interested in the truth, then really I think you should be interested in the truth in all its diversity mm. and richness nice. and not simply in which empirical claims can stand the test of scientific evidence. That's a very narrow view of truth. So what you were trying to do with your kid, I think, was, you know, you were trying to give her some, some sense of that, that, you know, rather than sort of think the, the key issue is, does Santa Claus exist, yes or no? And if it's no, end of story, chuck right. it out. Right. But to think, you know, what are, what are the truths, you know, the, the kind of behind, what, what's the story trying to tell us which is true? Well, yeah, and I'm getting the sense from, I mean, I haven't finished the book, but again, I'm getting the sense from you that you really, you have an issue, well, you talk about your team, I find that pretty funny, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the sort of the radical, we don't necessarily need to name any names, but the, the, the radical skeptics, skeptics or the radical atheists in the world who are saying that it, it, it's only true if, as you say, it's scientifically or empirically verifiable. If two plus two equals four, then I will believe it or I'll buy into it. Well, so much, it seems to me, of what we do on a day-to-day uh, basis with our friends and our families and so on is not empirically verifiable. We can't claim that it's scientifically uh, true uh, because we just, like, my wife, how do I prove that my wife loves me, you know, for instance? I mean, that that's just one simple example. I mean, there's so many other things, I suppose. Uh, you know, I guess the, but the question here is, Julian, you know, do we um, argue with other people? Do we try to convince other people rationally in a logical kind of mathematical way? Or do we actually appeal to them emotionally? Oh, well, that's the question about how you actually make your case. And that's, that's slightly complicated. And I think that you have to be realistic here. So um, Aristotle, in his rhetoric, uh, yeah, basically divides the art of rhetoric up in, into three components, and I'm going to get my Greek terms all mangled, I'm sure. But yeah, you know, he says that, first of all, there's ethos, which is character. So in order to be a persuasive speaker, you need that kind of, uh, to be someone of tr who's trustworthy, who can be taken as a reliable person. And then there's logos, which is reason. And then there's pathos, which is emotion. He believed you needed all three of those things in there in order to have effective rhetoric. Now, this term rhetoric, of course, I think has become somewhat debased today. If you say rhetoric today, it's normally got the word kind of mere behind sure, it. You know? sure. It's just mere rhetoric. We, and I think that's because what we think of as rhetoric is often that kind of speech which is very emotionally persuasive, but it lacks the integrity of the character behind it, and it also lacks the rational side. Now, 
I think that Aristotle was spot on. I think this is politically important, by the way, because I think that, you know, we do know, we can't be psychologically naive, we do know that people are most persuaded by emotional messages. That's what really grabs them. But at the same time, if we value a reason, if we value believing things for good reasons, basically, which is all it means, I think, to value reason, that you think you ought to have good reasons for what you believe and not just believe what your gut or your prejudice tells you, then you can't go down the road of simply piling all your persuasion onto uh, the emotional side of things. Now, I said it's politically important because I think that's a problem all over the democratic West. I think what's happened is that the, the arts of communication, to give them their polite terms, mm. uh, quite rightly kind of used by political parties who realised that, you know, you can't be naive, you have to have messages which emotionally resonate and so forth. But it's become all about that. It's become all about the messages that hit home, that are emotionally hot. The rational substance underneath it has been stripped out. And then what happens is when you start playing that game, you discover the people who play that game best are the people whose messages are all about what emotionally resonates and have nothing to do with what's rationally cogent. So I, I, I very much want to try and advocate a kind of return to that, you know, fully integrated form of rhetoric in which, you know, it's reason, character, uh, emotion are working together. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, did you, what was the phrase, fully integrated notion of rhetoric? Well, I can't tell you the phrase exactly because I was extemporizing, but uh, something like <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. Well, it's just kind of interesting in, 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 in this age of, or at least... The, this this recognized age now in the last several weeks or several months of fake news and what's been going on in 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 the U.S. and 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 how the campaign and Trump's campaign was presumably won. Well, exactly. I mean, it, it, I, you know, I wrote this book and it, you know I finished it. You know, what was it, eighteen months ago or something now? You know, by the time it came out and we we'd had the Brexit vote, you know, England, Britain voting to leave the European Union, and then the Trump victory. You know, it did seem like it was remarkably and unfortunately timely. But, you know, you've got to ask what's going on here. Now, the people use this phrase, the post-truth society. And I think we need to um, you know, pick away at that a little bit, because it's not the case that people literally don't care about truth. You know, you ask uh, Trump supporters what they believe the truth is, they'll tell you what they think the truth is. Um, and they think, you know, Hillary Clinton was crooked. They think that's true and so forth. So it's not that they have lost interest in the truth, but what they seem to have lost any kind of faith in are the tr what we traditionally would think to be required in order to support a claim for truth, mm. make cogent argument and good objective evidence. And good objective evidence, of course, does require you to rely to a certain degree on experts because we don't know what all the evidence is. Now, there's been a lack of... There's been a decline of trust and faith in those things. And so what's happened is, is that people now just trust their own truth. You know, they think there's nothing more reliable than what my gut tells me. There's nothing more reliable than what I instinctively feel. There's nothing more reliable than what my reason tells me, even if I don't push at it and work at it. And, of course, on top of that, no matter what you believe, if you go online, you'll find it reinforced uh, you know, a thousandfold because th this filter bubble effect where we're increasingly only seeing things which confirm our worldview. So, yeah, that's what post-truth is about. It's actually post the, uh, the the things which truth should rest on. Right. It's not a rejection of the idea of truth. So, oh, man, so many questions. So <laughs> are you, I mean, clearly you would make the distinction between rationalism and, and, and being rational, for sure, it seems to me. I mean, the whole notion of a rational skeptic sort of pre implies that, you know, skeptics can be irrational as well. Well, yes. I mean, you know, rationalism has various sort of meanings. I mean, one's very specific. I mean, in, in philosophical terms, you say rationalism, you're thinking of a particular school of philosophy as exemplified by Descartes, Spinoza in the 17th century, right? Um, I, I guess I'm, a, I, I'm not really keen to you know, call myself a rationalist in the, perhaps the broader sense, but I, not because there's anything kind of wrong with it, but I think there's one of the problems with putting yourself 
in that camp, seeing yourself as a, as a rationalist, is you've got to have that bit of that Hume scepticism about it. Sure. And again, no, empirical psychology tells us very clearly, I think, that we have to mistrust our own capacities to reason. And in fact, sometimes if we think of ourselves as being deeply rational, all that happens is we become more you know, blinder to the kind of prejudices and distortions of thinking which undermine our rationality. And so I, I, I mean, I, I'm against, I think if you self-identify too much as, oh, I'm a rationalist, I'm on the rational side of things, I think that risks a kind of overconfidence that your mm. own position is right and that, that you know how to use reason. So you know, that's why I'd resist that term. In other ways, I think it's a perfectly fine term. We all want to be small R rationalists of being reasonable. I suppose the other problem with the term is perhaps you know the, what will people think of? How do, will people interpret that? And I think that unfortunately, one of the bad images that reason and rationality now has is that people associate it with a kind of desiccating, scientific, you know, unemotional way of thinking. I don't think that's right, but unfortunately that's where we are. And I think so if you identify as a rationalist, people are going to think that, well, OK, that means, therefore, that, you know, you, what, you have no time for poetry, for you're, emotion, yeah. art. It's, yeah, that would be problematic, too. You're, you're, you're cold, you're calculating, you're, you're mathematical. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, that hasn't really helped by the fact that a lot of the people who most champion reason do kind of emphasise those side of things. You know, they emphasise the rational and particularly the scientific and, you know, I think this is a real problem because science doesn't have a monopoly on reason by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, science is in a kind of privileged position in the sense that there's a whole set of problems around the way in which the physical world works in which this kind of you know, empirical method, which actually is, is not easy to specify what it is, it gets us far really, really well. And I think because of that, people kind of look to science as being the the prime example of what reason can do. But of course, it can only do those things because the kind of problems it's dealing with are amenable to that kind of very precise measurement and so forth. As soon as you get into things like political science, economics, ethics, meaning of life, you, you, you can't, if you try to approach it with scientific tools, you end up missing the point. So the elevation of science as, you know, uh, the paradigm of what a rational person sounds stands for isn't very helpful, and and it's done, for example, you know, the humanist organisation. So again, I'm, I'm quite happy to call myself a you know a secular humanist, but I find myself often sort of disagreeing with things. And you know, in in recent years and decades in Britain, you know, the secular humanism has very much promoted kind of Darwin, almost like the secular saint. And so Darwin Day has turned into this big occasion where there were lectures and everything. Well, you know, Darwin was fantastic, probably is the most important theory. That, I'm not denying, not denying any of that, but the elevation of Darwin and Darwinism as kind of this special revered spot, I think, runs the risk that it makes it seem as though, you know, unless we... Yeah, that, that's what all kind of reason should aspire to be like, right. scientific. Right. Well, I think, it's, I think it's wonderful that in your introduction, you, you've you got a reference to Yeats and to J.G. Ballard. I just <laughs> think, you know, it's a character, no less, out of a novel uh, to use as a way to get a point across. I mean, do you find that, that there, there, hmm, uh, maybe the philosophical community might be willing to dismiss your approach because you're not analytical enough? You're not driven by the syllogism, if this, then this, if this, then this? Um, I, don't, I don't think so, actually. I mean, I think that I don't get, I mean, I do have, I've had dealings. I mean, my career has been pursued outside of academia, but I've always had contacts with it because... Mm -hmm. After I did my PhD, I started a quarterly magazine, The Philosopher's Magazine. I edited that for about 13 years. I stopped doing that about seven years ago. It's still going strong. I thoroughly recommend it to people, and I have no stake in it anymore, so that's not self-interest. Um, and, you know, 95% of our contributors are academic philosophers. We would interview academic philosophers. I still talk occasionally at academic conferences and so forth. So, you know, I have good relations uh, with academics, and... You know, I guess, you know, if people are, are critical of me, 
is behind my back. It's not to my <laughs> face. I think. I think. I, I. No, I don't. I don't think there's a problem because I think really, you know, the way the, the job I think I'm doing is primarily I, I see it as a kind of a, a synthesizing and communicating. Mm. So I make no claims at all to be a, a great original thinker. Um, what I'm trying to do is I think there's tremendous stuff coming out of you know academic philosophy and the history of philosophy, but it's linking it up with what's also coming out of other disciplines and linking it up with what's going on in the world in order to make sense of things. And that's not something which a lot of academics do, but I, but I don't find them hostile to it. In fact, I've had very kind comments from lots of academics. So, so was it not Hume who said that all metaphysical questions should be committed to the flames? Yeah, he did pretty much. So, yeah. so the thing was, Hume was very. I mean, he had these kind of big bold slogans, yes. which were um, slightly kind of uh, hyperbolic. He couldn't kind of resist them. <laughs> um, but it, but in but, a way, he's kind of. Yeah, it's consigned to the flames. Is is a bit too strong. It's a bit. It's a bit. It's a bit, it's a bit extreme. I mean. You don't you want to, and I think I read somewhere, uh, and it might have been a review, something about how you want to take reason and and um, okay, forgive me, but reassign it to its proper place in the disciplines, in 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 religion, in science, in 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 the social sciences, in politics, and so on. It, 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 is that a fair uh, statement? Alongside well, I, of it's, alongside it's, of Hume's comment. Yeah, yeah, no, I think so. I mean, really, you know, I just think the, the, one of the problems is that, you know, academics, one of the sort of pitfalls of academic life is that, you know, it is your job to push fine distinctions. That's kind of what you're doing. You know, it's not, it's not good enough in an academic uh, environment to settle for more or less the right view. You're trying to pick apart at things. And so what happens is within the kind of academic community and not just in philosophy, there are kind of, you know, disagreements about, you know, what truth is and what reason is and what rationality is and so forth. And these disputes get played out. But I think that the problem is that in all of that that's going on, what gets missed is that every participant in that debate must share some common conception of rationality. Otherwise, there'd be no way for them to debate these issues. You know, right. you, in order to have a reasoned debate about what reason is, you need to have some kind of shared conception of reason, right? So, I mean, I, th I talk about this in terms of thick and thin conceptions, which is a, a way of talking which owes itself to uh, Bernard Williams. We can have a kind of a thick conception of what it means to be rational. And what that means is we have a very specific idea about what actually you know, stands the test of reason, what is true, and, you know, what methods are the, the, the most effective in precise occasions. But we also have a shared thin conception of reason, which is really what I'm trying to set out in the book. And it's not so thin as to be meaningless. You know, there are things which don't count as reason, um, which, you know, people do genuinely say. But it, it's recognising the fact that we, we have this shared sense and that's what enables us to debate and argue and disagree together. Now, again, that's also politically important because, you know, in order, f you know, I think democracy, people talk about what's the important thing about democracy. And sometimes people get carried away by the idea it's about one person, one vote. It's about the electoral process. Well, that kind of dog, if you're only focused on the electoral process, you can have terrible, you know, sort of like domineering and illiberal and majoritarian, authoritarian democracies, right? What makes democracy work is a commitment to reasoning things out mm. collectively, mm -hmm. having the debate and having the argument. So it's not just an academic issue at all. And that's part of, I think, what's really worrying, actually, about a lot of the moves towards what's called populism in politics. If you look at the Trump campaign, and, you know, people can sort of, like, dismiss me and go, here we go, yeah, uh, you know, academic -y type philosophers bound to be anti-Trump, right? Um, sorry, but I am. And I think, you know, one of the things that's most disturbing about that was the visible absence of commitment to that. It was mm -hmm. like, you know, if we win, you know, Hillary's going to be put in jail. He's not going to stand by that now. But that was the attitude. You know, if we win, we do what we want, basically. And the losers can just go away and cry in the corner. Now, yeah, that's not the way democratic politics 
is one was successful. It's almost a he did actually interesting enough in his um, you know when he he claimed a victory in the election he did for a minute do the right thing, but there's no sign that he's actually going to do that in practice. You know, winners in democratic elections always have to then commit themselves to govern for everybody, not just the people who voted it. I mean, he paid lip service to that, but the all the rhetoric of the campaign. Suggest it wasn't about that. It was when the majority win, we sweep everyone else away. Debate ends with the election result. What, Julian, what, all fascinating stuff and so many different tributaries and, and uh, ways we could go with this. I, I uh, And sadly, we're going to have to wrap it up shortly. I can't believe how quickly our conversation has gone. But uh, tell me, are we, are we, hmm, are we losing our ability to rationalize? Are we are we becoming more emotive? Are we leaning on our faith based positions more? I mean, is that kind of a concern, or are you a little more concerned about the fact that we're putting too much emphasis on this, you know, uh, desire for scientific truth and reason and so on? Well, I think the currents are, are complicated. I think some people are putting too much emphasis on. The scientific aspect of reason. So, so there's an emphasis on reason, but only on a narrow aspect of it, and that's part of the reason why uh, that's a problematic because you can't build a broad coalition around the idea of reason if the idea of reason you're advocating is a narrow one. So that's problematic. Um, generally speaking, uh, a lot of public discourse is you know too much focused around what's persuasive, what pushes emotional buttons, and not around what is based on evidence. And there's the other factors I've mentioned. Pessimistic. I'm pessimistic in some ways, but you have to look at the positive currents as well. Mm. Clearly, you know, we're not literally losing our ability to reason because there are lots of spaces in in the world now where there's a lot of good rational reason debate going on. You know, the internet opens up the possibilities of echo chambers and fake news. It also opens up the opportunity of, of fact checking and so forth, and we've seen real advances with that. Actually, sure. you know, um, at the moment, yeah, there's kind of, there's kind of a battle going on, um, <laughs> and it probably will continue to go on. I don't know which way it's going to go, but I, I think what worries me really is that you know a lot of people who are on the side of reason, you know, even those people, you know, have perhaps learned to kind of that it's intelligent or smart to say, well, of course, there's no such thing as the truth, is there? Or, you know, well, of course, you know, what what might seem reasonable to me might not be reasonable to you. There's a kind of a, a kind of a default assumption that we're kind of all a bit relativistic now, or you know, everything's science. You know, it's that middle ground. I want I want to try and recapture that sense that we're actually most of us are and want to be reasonable, rational people, and we just need to recognise more openly what it means to be reasonable and rational, and to, to to try and engage with each other more in that way. Can I can I read a quote here from early on in the book? Quote, the, the dream that many philosophers have had is of a form of reason in which subjective judgment is banished, and everything that matters can be demonstrated with the rigour of an algorithm, close quote. I mean, are you, you're, you're looking for a little bit more of a human person, in our ability to reason, are you not in our dialogue? And maybe that's what I was getting at when I asked you the quote, the question about emotion versus, you know, emotive argumentation versus rational argumentation. I mean, it's all rational, I suppose, but, yeah. but, but aren't we working more on a human relational, uh, can I say soulful level where, where, you know, we don't, we don't get out a calculator to have a conversation. I don't say to you, hey, can I just check that premise before we continue? Uh, I want to make sure we're on the same page here. You know, we, 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 we're having a conversation. We're relating as human beings. And, and I don't know, I, 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 is that any of that making any sense? Yeah, no, it is. It is. I think that's true. I think, you know, as I say, the dream that a lot of people have had was that if we could, you know, get our premises straight and our way of reasoning straight, then we could uh, yeah, effectively settle all, all matters that matter, right. you know, like algorithmically. Really, you know, we could we could ar- we could arguably get a computer program to solve the problems for us. I think that you know, human reasoning is is embedded in human nature. People always bring their own characters and personalities to their thinking. Even scientists do. Now, in science, 
by the time you get to the end result, normally you can strip that away and you can leave it to be settled purely by the evidence and so forth. But actually, in a lot of things that really matter and count, you can't ever completely eliminate that element of subjective judgment. And I think, you know, for me, that's kind of something that has to be acknowledged. Is some, you know, I think there's a kind of philosopher which think it'd be shameful. It's kind of shameful and embarrassing to admit that any major issue might require this element of subjective personal judgment. Right. I think we should acknowledge that. The point is that not that we can eliminate that, but we. the point of reasoning is to reduce the role of that subjective judgment as much as possible, to see how, you know, to establish as much as we can in a way that all reasonable people would find themselves forced to agree and allow the subjective judgment only to do the work, you know, to take that final leap of faith, if you like, yeah. that reason can't take you with. And we have to be, be, be honest about that. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that a lot of people think that if reason isn't completely impersonal and algorithmic and with the precision of mathematics, then it collapses into subjective judgment. And I think it's not difficult to see that that's a, an absurd dichotomy. Right. That in fact, you know, your, your reasoning become more rigorous, more objective, but it doesn't mean you can eliminate every trace of the subjective. And we just have to be honest about that. Actually, one of the, originally I did want to call the book The Thin Ice of Reason, mm. because the metaphor here was that, you know, when we reason, we, we really are kind of skating on thin ice in lots of ways. Mm. You know, we like to think that reason is this robust thing, but a lot of the time it is, it is thin, but it's the only thing we've got to skate on. And, you know, we have to try and maintain our balance. How's, how's this for a connection? So David Cronenberg did uh, Crash by J.G. Ballard. He also directed Dead Zone with Christopher Walken, and I went to a scene where Christopher Walken says uh, quite uh, memorably, the ice is going to break. That's, yeah. that's where yeah, I well, went, Julian. Let's, every, try to, let's try not to break it. <laughs> every, every, everything comes back to a film reference, doesn't it? It, it, it does. Well, actually, for me, that goes out a film reference, a song, or a 1970s TV commercial. Oh, I'm afraid my nice. brain has been stuffed full of that. Nice. Listen, uh, one one last question, and I'm I'm absolutely. I listen. I want to book part two with you right now. But uh, anyway, I, I hope we can come back to this and do another con- uh, have another conversation in the new year. Um, so what now this crazy question to end on what do you do with faith you know augustine said i believe in order to know i mean what 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 do you do with those questions of of those metaphysical questions that hume wanted us to toss into the into the stove into the fire well listen i think you know this is a a, a, a complicated issue i think you know that what i kind of advocate is not just dismissing all sort of religious belief as a rejection of reason and rationality and, you know, just, just to treat faith as, and anyone of faith as though they are simply irrational, that's clearly not true. I think, you know, my view is that if you do reason about these things clearly, I think that the case against traditional forms of religious belief doesn't add up. But religion is an extremely complex phenomenon. Yes. And, you know, a lot of the time, people's faith is a bit like the Santa Claus thing, right? Now, the Santa Claus analogy is often used, you know, mockingly. Yes. By certain atheists, you know, people who believe in God are like people who believe in Santa Claus. But actually, a lot of the time, that's kind of potentially true in a, in a not offensive way. A lot of people perhaps believe in God in the way that you advocate believing in Santa Claus, which is that, you know, I mean, yeah, not, it's not a strict analogy, but it says what's important about belief in God for a lot of people isn't really whether there is this kind of being who is masculine and personal and inhabits a certain place in the universe and creates it. It's a kind of a value system, a way of orienting yourself to the world, a way of having a certain reverence for things we don't understand, a way of abiding with mystery, a way of having a purpose which transcends us, of seeing values beyond, all these things, right? And that's what their faith, yeah, it, it may well also include things that I just wouldn't agree with, and I right. think people are factually incorrect about, sure, you know, sure. it may involve things like belief in the resurrection of Jesus, but I didn't have so forth. But, you know, you take away those things that I think are factually false, there's a hell of a lot 
<laughs> unfortunate phrase, there's a hell of a lot left yeah. in faith, which is potentially of value. So I think, yeah, that's the conversation. That's another, it's another subject. I think I've written about and talked about. But another thing which I think is 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 massively underexplored, you know, and mis un, not understood properly uh, by a lot of a lot of atheists, you know. So you know, let's see what's let's explore what's valuable about faith. It's pretty. Well, it's, 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 I think it's really helpful. I just, ironically, interestingly, whatever you want to say it, I just started listening to an old CBC, which I guess would be your BBC, our Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, yeah. a series of six uh, shows on René Girard. And he basically says religion is the answer to violence. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a, wow, is that ever an oversimplification? But, 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 uh, but anyway, that's just, just started listening to those yesterday. So, so kind of, listen, Julian, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our conversation today. And, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have met you and uh, look forward to finishing your book. Uh, for, for those of you out there listening, uh, check, check uh, more of uh, what Julian has been writing about on micro philosophy.net. Uh, the name of the book is The Edge of Reason, subtitled A Rational Skeptic in an Irrational World, and um, by Julian Bagini. And uh, wow, Th- thanks again for your, your thoughts, your generosity, your insight. I, I've, 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 I've had a blast. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it too.